In 2014, the Comprehensive Agreement on the Bangsamoro, the final peace agreement between the Philippine government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, was signed. This agreement is an important milestone in what has been one of the longest ethnic conflicts in the world. Now that peace process in Mindanao has moved from the negotiation table to the implementation field, the region is in a flux, as the transition to a more preferred autonomy, represented by the Bangsamoro, is currently ongoing. The story of the Moro is one centered on issues of historical grievances, identity, and peace. In this episode, we ask, Ano nga ba ang Bangsamoro? Ano ang ugat ng sigalot sa Mindanao? At paano ba natin dapat sipatin ang kasaysayan ng Bangsamoro? Sapagkat ang Bangsamoro, hindi, hindi na, na bago yan. Hi, I am Liken Delari. I am Aaron Maliari. And I am Bekal Porha. And you are listening to Podcast, Conversations on Philippine History, Politics, and Society. Very interesting ang episode natin today. But before that, gusto ko munang magpasalamat sa ating mga listeners. Kasi last week, ang daming nagbe-message, nagkatag sa atin sa Facebook, sa Twitter, at sa Instagram na nasa top podcast nila tayo sa Spotify Rap 2021. So maraming maraming salamat. Sabi ko nga sa tweet ko, nakaka-touch at nakakilig. It makes all the effort, the time, and the resources all worth it. Lagi kong sinasabi na... Kahit isa lang ang nakikinig sa atin, happy na ako. Pero ayon sa ating stats at sa mga tags sa atin, no, lagpas naman sa isa. So, happy na rin. Oo naman, kasi sure naman tayong lalagpas sa isa kasi tatlo tayo eh, to begin with. <laughs> so, so di ba? So, totoo pero totoo. Maraming maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. Pagbubutihin pa namin. Wow, talaga. Napaka showbiz. Pagbubutihin pa namin. We, we really want to talk about topics that are important at madalas underrepresented sa mainstream. Kaya naman sa episode na ito, pag-uusapan natin ang Mindanao Conflict. Indeed. As a peace scholar, malapit talaga sa akin itong Mindanao Conflict. In fact, just recently, my paper on the peace process mediation of the Mindanao Conflict was published. So baka gustong i-check out ng ating mga listeners. Interest ko lalo na yung tagal ng proseso na pinagdaanan bago naabot itong punto na nagkasundo na ang pamahalaan at dati ang MNLF at ngayon naman ang MILF. Mahaba ang kasaysayan ng peace negotiations. Actually, yung pinakaunang peace negotiations, kung tamang pagkakaalala ko, 1970s pa lang yan eh, pero mas mahaba yung kasaysayan ng mga oppression at marginalization ng mga kapatid nating Moro sa Mindanao. At sa tingin ko, ano, bilang mga non-Muslims na mga lumaki sa labas ng Mindanao, the onus is on us to understand and relate to the history of the Moros. So kung totoong naniniwala tayo na bahagi ng lipunang Pilipino ang mga Moro, dapat kilalanin natin yung ugat ng Moro Independence Movement at kung bakit ninais nilang humiwalay sa Pilipinas. I agree. Only by understanding the basis of their grievances can we make sure that the injustices that they suffered will not happen again. And even more than that, sa papalapit na eleksyon, syempre, dapat din nating timbangin kung may sapat na atensyon na binibigay ang mga kandidato natin sa kanilang agenda para sa Mindanao at para sa mga Moro. Exactly. Hence, this episode. Swerte tayo kasi pinaunlakan tayo ni Professor Yasmira Moner, Acting Director ng Institute for Peace and Development in Mindanao at Assistant Professor uh, ng Mindanao State University Iligan Institute of Technology. At ang isang mahalagang itanong natin sa kanya ay, sino nga ba ang Moro at ano ang Bangsa Moro? This is her response. First of all, pagsabihin uh, Bangsamoro issue in Mindanao, hindi natin siya maihihiwalay doon sa historical formation ng Philippine as a nation state. No? Uh, the term itself, Moro, is a colonial construct which started way back during the Spanish colonization when during the pacification campaign, Uh, when the Spaniards um, colonized the Philippines, uh, they have encountered these fears no? and, and, and uh, courageous um, Islamized indigenous people, which uh, just like uh, the, their former colonizers, which are the Moors no? um, in Iberian Peninsula, have the same uh, features. 
culture where they adhere to the Islamic uh, faith. No? And so that's where they call this uh, Islamized indigenous people as Moros. Um, and that, I think, is also, it, it, that is why it becomes so pejorative because they also eventually use the term in a manner that will later on become disadvantageous no, to the Islamized indigenous people. Hence the term Moro. Now about the Bank Samoro, no, and and I guess uh, this is really that's why it's really a his, quite a historical reckoning. So during the Spanish pacification campaign, they were unsuccessful in conquering the Islamized indigenous people. They they then uh, call Moros, but they were successful in making those Christianized people from the north to treat these people as the others. No? And so then there was this historical animosity between the Christianized Filipinos no? and then the Islamized Moro people in the southern part of the country. And so come the uh, Treaty of Paris, where uh, Spanish colonies, including the Philippines, were ceded to the Americans. Where the Spaniards failed, the Americans um, succeeded in incorporating the unpacified Moro territory. And so, in a way, the Americans have waged a divide and rule tactic. And so, when they come a time when the Americans gave independence to the Philippine Republic, the Moro people you know, have formed a united front. And they call themselves the Bangsa Moro. Because from the, from the Malay term bangsa, which means nation, to distinguish themselves from the Christianized majority of Filipinos from the north, from Luzon and Visayas, and have continuously resisted the anti-colonial movements, which lasted and the height of that was the formation of the Moro National Liberation Front, or the MNLF, where it's, it's really an ethno-nationalist movement of a group of people distinct from the rest of the majority population adhering to Islam as a culture and a way of life and wanted to preserve their governance uh, distinct from, as I've said, from the majority. And so hence, the Bangsa Moro. It is very interesting how a derogatory term was actually taken by the Moros to make their own and to mean something else. Kumbaga, they subverted the colonizers sa proseso ng pag-aangkin nila ng Moro bilang identidad. At mahalaga yung usapin ng identidad sa proseso naman ng self-determination na sinuong ng mga Moro. So we asked Yasmira tungkol sa roots of the Mindanao conflict and it is what she had to say. Well, I guess in the history of the Philippine nation building, it's sad that there's this lacking no, or missing piece no, of that important of a hist historical uh, fact about uh, the struggle for political right to self-determination. The creation of the what we now know today as the BARM no, uh, is just uh, reclaiming no, the, the, the so-called lost sovereignty the formation of these so-called Moro states no, uh, antedated the creation of the Philippine as a republic, as a nation state. Uh, the Sultanate of Sulu, the Sultanate of Magindanao, the uh, Pat Apungan Pungkuranao, uh, and Sultan of Boayan wa were already considered to be states, no? having uh, this uh, people practicing their own sets of customs, traditions, practices, and of course, Sultanate as their form of government, which is very centralized, adhering to the Sultan or the Datu, you know, the Sultan specifically, and, and recognizing that, that authority you know, um, as a source of not just social but political power. And so when the colonizers came, particularly the Spaniards and then the Americans, that's where um, they have formed that united confederacy and call themselves the Bank Samoro. So the root of Mindanao independence movement or the Moro independence movement was really about sovereignty-based conflict or identity-based conflict where the self, which is a political identity, wants to call itself Moro because they believe that their social, political, cultural, economic, 
and um, their uh, way of life is uh, distinct from that of uh, the uh, rest of the of the population that is conquered now by the Western colonizers. And so, from the anti-colonial resistance movements, it has grown. Uh, it has evolved uh, dynamically into wars of national liberation, influenced by what is also happening uh, at the turn of the 20th century, um, that globally there is this decolonization uh, uh, movement or post-colonial countries where colonizers were starting to basically give you know, an independence to their former colonies. And the Philippines, under the American tutelage, has also gained such independence. Uh, while the Moro people were also doing that nation-state building as a process of uh, solidifying their claim to the right to self-determination according to international law, where it was uh, made known uh, that it was recognized under international law that that, that uh, ethnic minorities you know, who have been uh, enjoying the right to freedoms have the right to demand their uh, right to RSD or right to self-determination. And so the Moro people are not, you know, uh, their right to self-determination is not unique. It's a global movement. And, and it's just so happened that um, uh, it has uh, gone through a lot of um, political um well, they tour, and, and now we have this, uh, finally, this autonomous arrangement, you know, uh, which is a product of a political settlement. And so, yeah, it, it has really gone a long way. So the movement heart back to the very beginning, bago pa magkaroon ng Pilipinas. The argument is that the Bangsamoro has existed and predated the Philippines as a political entity. The goal of the movement, therefore, is to reclaim the sovereignty that the Moros lost in the advent of colonialism. At sabi nga ni Yasmira, identity ang batayan nitong laban ng mga Moro. Kaya naman, mula sa paglaban sa mga kolonisador, yung naging trajectory ay mag-resist sa Philippine State kung saan ang kapangyarihan ay nakakonsentrate syempre sa isang gobyernong kristyano. But Yasmira warns us na although sovereignty at identity-based itong Mindanao conflict and that despite the fact that Moro is a collective term, hindi ibig sabihin na homogeneous itong grouping na ito. As you know, uh, the primordial ties of the Bangsamoro people is very much along ethnic and uh, clan uh, ethnic lines, you know? And so there was this um, sort of like social ethnic uh, schism. You know? So along the line of, of course, the three politically dominant groups, the Maguindanao, the Tausug, and the Maranao. And interestingly, during the American period, the Americans were able to successfully collaborate with, uh, with these moral leaders, you know? uh, the traditional aristocrats, you know? whom they were uh, successful no, in, in um, trying to at least vote for their uh, right to have a political space in the Philippine Republic through parliamentary means. So, so the case of uh, one of the forerunner of the Bangsamoro Liberation Organization, no, who then became Congressman Rashid Lukman, or uh, the case of the very successful politician no, uh, from the Maguindanao Empire, Salipada Pindatan, who became a senator. And, and we know also that in Sulu, there was also this war of pacification. And later on, for example, the, the chairman of MNLF, uh, Nur Miswari, became governor. No? That was later part. No, of the history. But what I'm saying is that there was this um, sort of um, in, inherently primordial ties on loyalty to one's ethnic group. And so the Bangsamoro is very much having this tenuous collective no, or tenuous uh, political identity. No? So madali pong naging instrumental siya, no? In terms later on with the new Philippine state, they have opened up spaces, for example, for this Muslim elite no, for, to exercise power. So the creation, for example, of Muslim of, uh, Office of Muslim Affairs. No? And then later on, uh, nagkaroon po ng negotiation. So I think isa po talaga sa pinakamahalagang nangyari noon no, is yung pagbubukas ng um, Center for um, National Integration no, or a CNI, Commission rather on National Integration, kung saan uh, yung edukasyon no, um, na inopen up ng mga ng, uh, ng Philippine government no, uh, under American tutelage uh, na kung saan uh, naging kabahagi no, yung, yung uh, ibang miyembro no, ng Muslim uh, communities para 
para mapag-aralan din nila no yung kanilang societal ills no within the moral community and that somehow sort of created that socio-political space for possible negotiated agreements. I agree with this Mira. I think it's itong mahalagang point kasi kadalasan we think of Moros as a single unit when it is actually not a homogeneous and united ethnic group. My ethnic divisions within Moros mismo. I believe there are 13 ethnic groups that constitute the Moro. At kanya-kanyang cultural identities din yung mga yan. Ako naman, uh, interesante yung pagbanggit ni Yasmira sa CNI or yung Commission of National Integration. And I think this represented the way the Philippine Independent State copied the American colonial government sa integration ng mga Muslim sa Philippine State. Sabi ni Romel Kuraming sa article na Historical Injustice and Human Insecurity, Conflict and Peacemaking in Muslim Mindanao, uneven at ambiguous daw ang resulta ng effort ng Estado. In many ways, they integrated, alienated, developed, modernized, marginalized, and minoritized further the Muslims. Lalo na itong CNI na to. Kasi kung yung isang bahagi ng programang ito ay yung pagbibigay ng scholarships para makapag-aral sa Maynila ang mga Moro. So in Manila, they were alienated because they were Muslims. At the same time, na-radicalize sila. And an interesting link to the Muslim independence movement is that isa sa mga beneficiaries ng CNI scholarship na yan ay si Nur Miswari. But anyway, ano nga ba ang immediate roots ng Muslim independence movement? This is uh, very much rooted no, doon sa feeling of historical marginalization, social exclusion, political underrepresentation, or even misrepresentation. It's uh, instructive to look into the idea that when we gain, no, when we earn the independence, when the Americans binigyan tayo ng, kapay, uh, ng independensya or, or ng kalayaan ng Amerika ay naging ano naging promised land ang Mindanao no that was proclaimed by the Commonwealth President himself uh, Manuel El Quezon and resource rich no ang ang Mindanao uh, sumunod nito yung mga naging mga batas na nilagdaan no ng mag, ng mga sumunod na presidente Quirino Magsaysay Carlos P Garcia hanggang doon sa kay Marcos no lalong-lalo na no nung nagkaroon ng diktadura ay naglalayo no na magkaroon ng resettlement programs na tila baga ang ang pangakong ito no uh, nung mga naghihimagsik uh, na mga landless no mga peasants doon sa Luzon ay na- nabigyan ng isang panibagong pag-asa no sa Mindanao no through the resettlement programs at the expense of the Islamized indigenous people and of course yung mga uh, non-moro IPs no and then later on nagkaroon na nga ng tri people no dito sa Mindanao no and i think dahil nga doon sa systemic uh, discrimination na kung saan yung formerly na nag enjoy no ng kanilang governance system na nakabase doon sa kanilang socio-cultural ways of life ay ngayon biglang na sideline no do- dahil doon sa systemic discrimination no na state led pa so um dala nito no naging na, na naramdaman no na ng, ng mga bangsa moro uh, ng mga bangsa moro no ng mga muslim sa Pilipinas na tila baga hindi sila itinuturing na kapwa Pilipino no um, they were alienated from their own land which is a source of their identity they were made to follow the rules alien to them like the torrent system of land titling with in fact their uh, customary laws tells them that land belongs to god and so they have this concept of pusaka you know, uh, wherein land is owned by the Almighty. And so land is sacred. You know, it's not just about profit. So for them, it's really it's really about injustice, no? In a way that they have been, historically, they were annexed um, without their plebiscitary consent. And then later on, 
uh, biglang nabago no yung takbo ng buhay nila dahil dun sa resettlement program ng government yung development agenda ng gobyerno ay hindi kasama no yung mga kapatid nating moro dahil nga they were even systematically discriminated no in the process of this national development no and uh, and uh, no structurally speaking Mindanao no the last frontier ika nga no yung especially in the Muslim Mindanao areas became so poor no in this arrangement and that really kumbaga yun talaga yung culmination no ng Moro rebellion in the 1970s idagdag mo pa yung political uh, persecution no uh, and of course no uh, the Jabeda massacre that took place no where it was really the galvanizing force no that kind of uh, become so symbolic no uh, for the young progressive moro leaders they really fought for the what they deemed to be a systematic marginalization uh, injustice no the grave abuse of human rights uh, which they believe no has no place in in su- supposedly the philippine republic so ganun ganun kalalim yung sugat no nang nanaramdaman ng mga bangsa moro noon Meron na tayong episode on the Jabeda Massacre. So sa ating listeners, if you are interested in a deeper discussion on this, check out the link in the description. So I think uh, kailangan nating i-highlight yung fact na it was really Marcos who actually was the catalyst that sparked the Muslim independence movement. Nabanggit din ni Yasmira yung rapid economic change dulot ng resettlement programs. Ano? Although on this issue, I echo the argument of Patricio Abinales. Ang sabi niya sa librong Making Mindanao, Cotabato and Davao in the Formation of the Philippine State, the resettlement program is a factor, but it is not the most decisive one. Inanak ng Estado sa ilalim ni Marcos itong independence movement ng mga Moro. At lumala pa lalo nang naging malinaw na hindi intent ng pamahala ni Marcos na solusyonan ang mga hinaing ng mga Moro. But interestingly, the effort to find solutions to the problems in Mindanao through a peace process is actually almost as old as the conflict itself. Here's what Yasmira tells us about this. Well, interestingly, alam natin na the mother document of the arm was the Tripoli Agreement. And that was entered into during the Marcos regime. The Marcos cunning agreement, no? At that time, yung nag-facilitate ng GPH MNLF peace negotiation was Libya. Marcos, who was then reluctantly entered into a negotiation because there was already the internationalization of the Bangsamoro struggle and the uh, Organization of Islamic Conference, or at the time, International OIC uh, Cooperation, no? uh, were um, gaining traction. No? At tinutulungan na nung na, uh, lalo na no na pick up na nung mga muslim countries yung nangyayaring persecution no nung mga minoritized population no na mga muslim at nakita nga nila no dito sa Pilipinas sa southern part is may na, ganung nangyayaring phenomenon no and so the OIC has uh, played a huge role and Libya became the facilitator of this peace talk and uh, cunning as he was he Uh, Marcos uh, sent Emelda as the envoy and he was successful in terms of, well, say, diluting the process of um, genuine, um, a stronger autonomous region you know, that comprises 12 provinces and uh, cities including Zamboanga, Davao, and Anpalawan Archipelago to what then became RA 6734 na kung saan yung Karen 5 Barm Provinces, namely Maraam, Lanabel Sur, Magindanao, Sulu, Tawi-Tawi, no, uh, Basilan, no, at hindi pa noon kasama ang Marawi City at ang Isabela, ang naging uh, core territory ng autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao na maraming nagsasabi na mga scholar, no, at kabilang na nga po dito, no, the Magindanao scholar uh, Abu Said Linga, course, Jul Kipli Wadi of U- uh, Institute of Islamic Studies in UP Deleman and uh, Sokarno Tanggol no? uh, na ang kanyang dissertation, no? ang current chancellor ngayon sa MSUIIT, yung kanyang dissertation sa UP and CEPAG, uh, the, the myth and rhetoric of autonomy no? in Muslim Mindanao. And according to that paper, no? na even of course uh, makapado muslim no um, na uh, ang sinasabi no no kanilang uh, isinulat ay ang autonomous region in muslim mindanao was designed to fail because it was only an administrative autonomy there was no 
genuine decentralization of political power because there was no financial autonomy. No? So, para nga lang siyang token form, no? yun talaga yung ginamit no? na word ni Dr. Tanggol no? sa kanyang dissertation na token autonomy, no? yung, yung arm. So, in the end, hindi talaga nakagawa no? ng isang meaningful autonomy that will address the Muslim rebellion no? or yung right to self-determination, right to self-governance ng bangsa moral people. At uh, alam natin na ang nangyari noon ay is yung uh, ginawang Tripoli Agreement na uh, na tumiwalag si Miswari kasi alam niya na wala talagang teeth yung batas na yun. No? It was unilaterally implemented by Marcos no? at nagkaroon nga ng two autonomous regions, Region 12 and Region 9. And so uh, the MNLF went back underground and and so when the people power uh, happened uh, and uh, then uh, President Cory Aquino became the president, she opened again the negotiation with the MNLF. No? And that, that was then how the arm was implemented where the MNLF, no, the founding chair, Nur Miswari, became the governor. So um, because um, uh, hindi na nga talaga, no, um, yung yung soul no ng autonomy no which is political and fiscal autonomy was it there in the law kaya um, hindi talaga no hindi talaga yun yung solusyon no doon sa political injustice no uh, sa uh, sa bangsa moro kaya nagpatuloy pa rin talaga yung secessionist movement no and that was continued by the moro islamic liberation front later on Sabi nga ni Yasmira, token autonomy yung ibinigay ni Marcos sa mga Moro. Kaya lalo nagalit yung mga Moro actually at nagbalik sila sa kanilang independence demands. Very contentious itong period na ito from Cory to Ramos. The contention was mostly about the basis for autonomy and the form that the autonomous region would take. When the MNLF signed the final peace agreement noong 1996, doon na nag-declare yung MILF, yung Moro Islamic Liberation Front, na hindi sila happy. Na itutuloy daw nila yung laban for a more preferred setup. Kaya rin nagpatuloy yung conflict sa Mindanao. At ang dami pang nangyayari sa narrative na to ha. Like yung all-out war ni Erap at yung debacle surrounding the uh, Memorandum of Agreement on Ancestral Domain. that plunged Mindanao back to the conflict noong time naman ni GMA. Uh, we covered this in another episode. Check the episode description for the links to this na lang. Maganda yung episode na yan. Check nyo na lang. Iniisip ko, isa sigurong medyo nakakalito para sa karamihan. Ano nga bang pinagkaiba ng Bangsamoro or ng BARM sa ARMM? This is how Yasmir explained it. The, the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao is a product of, well, 17 years of negotiation with the MILF no? uh, and 40 years no, to provide a comprehensive agreement. And uh, lagi naman natin sinasabi no, na dahil nga sa aspirational no, itong ating uh, ipinaglalabang autonomia, Uh, maraming interest no yung nakasalalay no interest hindi lamang nung mga nung mga bangsa moro people pero kasama na din syempre no yung ating mga kapatid na non moro IPs no at saka yung mga yung ating Christian uh, migrants no na, na dito na din namuhay sa Mindanao na mulat no at marahil naiisip din nila na kasama tayo doon sa pakikibakang ito no sa political na pagbabago ng rehiyon What is very instructive no in the Bangsamoro organic law is the acknowledgement the acknowledgement of the distinct political identity of the Bangsamoro no as uh, um, as uh, reflected in the in the uh, definition of the identity no as described or defined in the Bangsamoro organic law RA 11054 where it stipulated that the Bangsamoro are the original inhabitants or natives uh, uh, who uh, wasn't colonized by the Spaniards and who ascribed to such identity. So in a way, naging malawak po ano, ang, uh, ang naging description. No? Um, ng, dahil, nga po, dahil nga ito ay isang shared socio-cultural identity. No? Kung baga, pwede nating sabihin no, in sociological term, it's a social construct. 
And it's uh, really something that was constructed as we fought for what we think is good for for the society of the Bangsamoor that were historically marginalized. And I'm saying uh, that it's socially constructed kasi meron din pong internal debate within the Bangsamoro peoples uh, themselves na may mga, may mga uh, Muslim Filipinos or Filipino Muslims sinasabi nila, hindi naman kami Bangsamoro. No? So kung baga may internal debate then is the Moro and Muslim identity uh, interchangeable? Are they synonymous? No? Kaya identity-based conflict really is very contentious, contested, and fluid. And right now, the Bangsamoro, no, um, as uh, yung pinakamalaking tanong no, na kung ano yung pagkakaiba niya, the Bangsamoro as it is now in the barn is a political unit. It's a political unit that is more than Muslim Mindanao. In the in the BOL, it was clearly stipulated that the Bangsamoro as a shared negotiated space must accommodate inclusivity in the process where the rights and privileges uh, of the non-Moro constituencies of the region must be protect- protected, recognized, and adhered to. So a rights-based approach, no, ang pinanggalingan nitong batas na ito, it's the enabling law which created this um, new model of government kasi unitary ang ating national government but sa regional government ito po ay naging ministerial or parliamentary in for in nature. Parliamentary in as much as the Philippine uh, uh, government no, uh, through the negotiating uh, parties, the GPH and the MILF have both recognized the need to change, you know, the need to have structural reforms and the need to build institutions that will bring forth or advance uh, genuine political and financial autonomy. So a parliamentary system as it operates now in the Bank Samoro where uh, the uh, chief minister is uh, to be elected by uh, the member of the parliament, which is supposedly a legislative body that is elected by virtue of party-based politics and mature kind of politics because there is also this stipulation of the need for the, for the parties to have gender inclusion the inclusion of the uh, the women, the youth, indigenous people, no. Uh, so it's really it's really a very promising no uh, enabling law, um, and the parliament and the parliamentary model of government is hoped to also steer no uh, the, the 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 very contentious debate on is the Philippines ready for charter change. Because we've been really, um, there's this debate no, about the need for the country to have a charter change to accommodate also the need to have a federal form of government, as many advocates would have it. In fact, bagitin ko na din, although uh, this, 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 this is something I, uh, I've heard in one of the fora I attended, that um, that's why uh, Bongbong Marcos, one of the presidential aspirants, um, is quite popular in Mindanao, particularly in island provinces, because his uh, campaign promise is the federal shift. Many were saying, those who are critical of the, of the BARM, were saying that if we do not shift to a federal system, then it would remain to be a token form of autonomy pa rin daw, no? Uh, kasi nga hindi uh, pa rin siya uh, magiging marirealize no? in a unitary form of government where very centralized pa rin yung kapangyarihan. So, yun yung isa, no? Siguro sa ma underscore So, a political unit that is more than Muslim Mindanao. It is a shared space for Muslims and non-Muslims. Ang ganda ng vision na ito for the Bangsamoro kasi totoo naman na dapat may coexistence at na-recognize yung diversity sa Pilipinas. And I agree with Jasmira when she said that BARM is in some way a litmus test for federalism. Well, at least before the pandemic. Ano? But I would also argue that the BARM also tells us that the shared sovereignty set up proves that the Bangsamoro could coexist with the Philippine unitary state. Isang kuling tanong natin kay Yasmira, paano nga ba natin dapat i-engage ang mga kandidato natin sa darating na eleksyon tungkol sa nagpapatuloy na transition ng Bangsamoro 
at ng lugar na Mindanao sa ating national agenda. This was her response. I think we should ask them difficult questions. We should really seriously take into consideration the creeping historical amnesia, no? Uh, because we cannot move on as a nation if the the younger generation are taught that let's move on, you know, the, uh, let's move on from the past. But we cannot move on. We could not heal as one. We could not reconcile if there was this clear blindness of the historical injustices. I just like to point out, for example, 10 years after the um, Patuan massacre, you know, but um, it's still pretty much uh, there's a denial of justice for those who, who died from that massacre, you know, from that very painful contemporary history, you know, that was a product of the entrenchment of warlordism in Mindanao politics. I hope that we realize how important it is to elect leaders that will really serve the interests of the public. I know it's easier said than done. And sa panahon ngayon, lalo ng pandemia, di ba? maraming nawalan ng trabaho, maraming naghahanap ng trabaho. There's a lot no, who are economically insecure. No, I-highlight ko lang din, isa din sa siguro one way of engaging no, our uh, national candidates in office is to also rally uh, about the common issues that is not really so divisive. No? We have this global threat of terrorism. I mean, Marawi crisis happened and that was unthinkable. If we do not address it proactively and then we're just using the purely militaristic or hardcore security you know, or the traditional solution, you know, making use of our security sector, is ano pa rin, no? Kumbaga, matatawag pa rin na containment, neutralizing, but hindi pa rin siya preventive. And I think as a peace advocate, I would like to zero in the importance of systemic approach to a complex problem that we are experiencing in Muslim Mindanao, particularly in Bangsamoro. And again, the Bangsamoro is a shared space where we could continuously dialogue. Dahil ang Bangsamoro, bilang isang forma ng gobyerno, ay hindi lamang po para sa MILF, hindi lamang po siya para sa mga Moro, para po ito no, sa bawat Pilipino na nangangarap na magkaroon ng isang mapayapa at masaganang pamumuhay that is free from fear of possible Marawi or free from persecution, free from discrimination. no And very, very importantly, there is that acknowledgement, that humility to give space for everyone. Hindi lang po yung sinasabi natin sa amin ng Mindanao, no, dayo lang kayo dito because times have changed. Mindanao now, no, uh, statistically, no, mara, da, na minoritize na nga yung Moro people. At hindi din po kasi Salanan, especially dahil may mga ano na, diba, yung mga kapatid natin, mga Kristiyano, is dito na sila pinanganak. No? And so there's this I think a uh, unifying identity of Mindanawan, no? Kusog Mindanawan. And I think if only to to be really so proactive about it, let's start to assert the need for a truly inclusive Mindanawan development. Uh, because uh, ang ang kapayapaan at ang kasaganaan, no, sa Mindanao would also uh, speak volume about about national development, no? Especially na Marami pong uh, yaman dito sa Mindanao. At kung mapayapa po ang Mindanao, makaka-contribute po no, ang nang masaganang pamumuhay no, para sa lahat. No, at hindi lamang po yung mga taga-Mindanao. So, we should ask the hard questions, sabi nga ni Esmira. Itanong natin sa mga kandidato, how do you plan to deal with the historical grievance in Bangsamoro? Kasi, hindi naman ibig sabihin na may barm na Tapos na ang problema sa Mindanao. Uh, saka, paano dapat i-approach yung manifestation ng mga national issues na talamak din sa Mindanao tulad na lang ng dynastic politics? At syempre, paano magpapatuloy ang rehabilitation ng Marawi at yung pangkalhatang programa ng pamahalaan kaugnay ng kapayapaan sa buong bansa, hindi lang sa Mindanao? These are indeed the necessary questions we need to ask during these elections. 
And with that, we end another episode of Hindi na Bago Yan. Maraming salamat kay Professor Yasmira Moner for being our resource person uh, for this episode. At kung gusto nyong mapanood or mapakinggan ang buong interview natin with Yasmira, you can visit our website, podcast.org. And as always, like, subscribe, or follow our social media pages for updates on the show. At sa susunod na linggo, samahan nyo kami muli sa isa pang episode ng Hindi na Bago Yan. For now, thank you for listening and have a good day.